Hello, and welcome to Checking the Vitals, a podcast powered by Specialty Care. I'm Todd Schlosser, and today my guest is Dr. Mark Lee, the Chief of Neurosurgery at Lehigh Valley Health Center. In this conversation, Dr. Lee and I discuss a lot of topics, ranging from how he got into neurosurgery to how imaging has changed the way neurosurgery is done. I think you will particularly enjoy his top three different areas of innovation that have helped revolutionize neurosurgery. But for now, enjoy Checking the Vitals with Dr. Dr. Lee. Today I am on location at the Lehigh Valley Health Network with Dr. Mark Lee. (laughs) Beat me to it. Dr. Mark Lee, who is the chief of neurosurgery here. Uh, And I'd like to start off the podcast with this question, and that is simply, what was it that drew you to have a passion to like work in healthcare? Um, I don't know about healthcare in general, Mm -hmm. but I can tell you a story about uh, neurosurgery, which is what I ended up doing. Oh, awesome. Yeah, let's do that. So I actually went to medical school not intending to be a clinician. I went to medical school to do research. I had come out of a graduate school program getting Mm -hmm. my PhD in chemistry. Yeah. And I thought that having some contact with the biological sciences would help me in research. So I went to medical school fully intending to be in a lab somewhere. And at the very end of my medical school clinical rotations, I had to do a neurology rotation, which nobody wanted to do. <laughs> no offense to the neurologist, but... Sure. Uh, I mean, you are one now. So. Well, I'm a neurosurgeon. <laughs> well, okay. So um, I happened to do a neurology rotation at a very small hospital within our medical school system. Mm-hmm. And the two neurology directors of that rotation took one look at me and they realized that I probably wasn't going to be a neurologist. <laughs> So they sent me down to the OR, where there was uh, a neurosurgeon named Marx Bowens, mm-hmm. who was at that time probably in his late 50s, early 60s. Okay. And the first day, he said, come on in, scrub in, and uh, help me do this tumor. So for the next six weeks... Is this before you had any sort of general surgery residency? or I, I was not a resident yet. I was a medical student. Oh, okay. And uh, for the next six weeks, he let me first assist him in almost every case that he did and got me wow. interested in neurosurgery. I changed my entire study plan. Yeah. And I eventually applied to neurosurgery residency. Okay, so let's sort of unpack a lot of that. That's an awesome story, though. And that's, I mean, he obviously didn't have to do that. He, Correct. Yeah, he just, out of the kindness of his heart or wanted wanted to pass on his passion for neurosurgery. I think so, yeah, and he that's... must have seen something in me that, uh, that, that sparked that dynamic. Yeah, well, and the uh, neurology folks saw it too, and they, that's why they passed you off. Yeah. <laughs> but so you went to Caltech and yes. got your PhD in chemistry, is that correct? Correct. And then you went to Harvard Medical. Correct. And that's when, when you had that experience, right? When you were there at, um, at Harvard, did that add any time to your you know, studying of medicine at Harvard, or was it just the regular medical program? Because you, did you change from a research focus to a neurosurgery focus, and does that change require that you spend more time there? I no, guess? no, the, okay. the, the school timing was the same. Okay. While at Harvard, I did a postdoctoral fellowship and medical school kind of at the same time. Oh, okay. So I was fully entrenched in research at the time. Yeah, okay, so you were, <laughs> so then you shifted to neurosurgery. Yeah. So. When you, how did you choose the residency you ended up in? So um, there's a match system in mm-hmm. residency training. Every applicant applies to the intended positions and it's just like trying to get into college. Mm-hmm. You apply to the programs that you think you'd be interested in. Right. They interview you and then there's a rank list where each of the applicants ranks their number one choices right. and each of the programs ranks their number one choices and there's a computerized match that allows you to go to whichever residency program that you you end up in. So you sort of pick your favorite, they sort of pick their favorite uh, candidate, and then the computer sort of assigns the schools based upon. Correct. That's a pretty good system. It's a great system. Um, It's a little surprising sometimes when you wake (laughs) up one day and you find out you're going to. Oh, I'm moving. Yeah, and so in my case, I moved to New York. Yeah, and and so you went from, I'd imagine, Boston to New York. Yeah. Uh, and then you were in New York for about, was it? Six years. Six years, okay. Doing your neurosurgery residency. Is that a, I've seen residency times vary. Is that a common time? 
for a yeah, neurosurgery residency? Yeah, residency is somewhere between five and eight years, depending okay. on specialty training, sure. depending on how much research you do in the middle of that training. Sure. So you finished that residency, and I think you stayed in New York for a few years after that. It, three years after Three that. years, and then you ended up here. So how did you end up at Lehigh Valley? Um, I was recruited here, actually, by the former CEO of uh, Lehigh Valley Health Network, okay. uh, Elliot Sussman. Mm -hmm who wanted somebody who was uh, a little bit younger, I think maybe um, somebody to uh, bring some of the newer technologies in neurosurgery mm -hmm. to this area. So, and that was 2003? 2001. 2001, okay. So you've been here for a, a good number of I years. this is my 18th year. So you were, were you recruited in as chief of neurosurgery? I was recruited in as chief of neurosurgery. Probably too young for the job, <laughs> but well, you can say that now it, with you know hindsight being twenty twenty. <laughs> but but I'm sure at the time you felt like you were ready for the challenge. I was a little I was a little apprehensive. Okay, but uh, probably ready for the challenge. Yeah. Well, I mean, clearly you're ready for the challenge because you didn't wash out in a year. Right. So. I'm still so, here. Yeah. They kept you on, so you did something. For right. better or worse, I'm still here. <laughs> so uh, you did mention uh, while we were setting, sort of setting up and having a chat beforehand that this is a uh, Trauma One Center, uh, and it's a uh, Stroke Designation Center. What was the? So uh, we are a Level One Trauma Center. Level One Trauma Center. And a Comprehensive Stroke Center. Okay, so what are the qualifications to be able to get that, that, those classifications? So for trauma, there are several qualifications, uh, mm -hmm. including resources. Uh, there have to be um, both subspecialty clinical resources that are available almost immediately within mm -hmm. 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, OR resources and the ability to do certain types of cases, mm -hmm. the, the ability to take care of certain types of patients, especially the sicker ones. Sure. And uh, we were actually the first level one trauma center designated in the state of Pennsylvania. Oh, wow. And because we happened to be next to a very large interstate, yeah. uh, we have a large population of trauma patients and uh, we sure. continue to be very, very busy. So was a lot of that, um, I'd imagine trauma, that's you know people who are having severe brain hemorrhages, things like that that are happening and they have to get here as fast as possible, they have to be worked on as fast as possible. Those, is it that, those kind of situations? Correct. So. Um, yeah. We, as neurosurgeons, we see mostly traumatic brain injury and traumatic spinal injuries. Yeah, I imagine like people from accidents, like car accidents, or you know, we have an amusement park across the way. Yeah, car accidents, yeah. falls. Um, we see lots of hunting accidents in, in yeah. during deer season. Uh, we oh see, wow, yeah, I didn't think about that, but yeah, we see annually. We always see one or two people falling out of deer stands. Um, you know, uh, yeah. significant injuries just from, from daily life, yeah. but mostly blunt traumas from auto accidents. Yeah. So, uh, and a lot of those, um, I have a little bit of experience in that, a, a lot of those um, can cause your brain to bleed. Uh, Correct. And then that, that bleeding causes pressure, and that, that can obviously severely damage the brain and ultimately end in that patient. You know, Correct. Expiring. That's the, the, the one the one issue that we try to mitigate as sure. neurosurgeons is the secondary injury to the brain from yeah. raised pressure. Yeah. And that raised pressure is usually because the brain starts to swell mm -hmm. in response to the primary injury, which mm -hmm. can be uh, just a contusion. Yeah. Um, or you know, you hit your head and there's a bruise and that bruise starts to bleed or mm -hmm. it can be a more severe bleed. But uh, that's, the, that's the reversible and treatable uh, cause of injury that we're trying to mitigate. Right. Surgeries like cardiovascular surgery have been going on much, much longer than, you know, neurosurgery have. So, like, they've had much more time to innovate and work on, you know, surgical techniques. And I've seen that neurosurgery seems to have, like, a quicker pace of innovation. And that this may just be, you know, anecdotal because I haven't talked to every neurosurgeon. So you may be surprised to find out yeah. that neurosurgery is older than cardiac surgery. Really? So the first documented, uh, well-documented series of human neurosurgical cases was Victor Horsley, and that was right around the time of Lincoln. <laughs> so it's been yeah. around for a while yeah, now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, the, the field was in its infancy for a long time. Yeah, I feel like it sort of got ramped up around the computer age, it's sort of the way I sort of see it, which I'm fine to be wrong about, but I'd love for you to educate me on. So, <laughs> so I think one of the interesting things about neurosurgery is that because the brain 
is housed in a closed container, sure. i.e. the skull, yeah. um, it was always very difficult to see inside that box, yeah. right? So for the longest time until we had good imaging, it was just a guess as to where lesion was. Sure. So if you look back at the old neurosurgical literature, uh, Harvey Cushing, who was a, a famous American neurosurgeon who operated in the 1920s, mm -hmm. many of those early neurosurgical procedures were explorations to try to find a problem. Yeah. And those explorations were negative as many as 30 to 40 percent of the time. So it really wasn't until the advent of the CAT scan, which came out in about 1975, mm -hmm. that we were able to see inside that box before we violated the box. Sure. And that changed the whole thing. So you're right. The yeah. computer age, the age of um, uh, the age of technology, yeah. really allowed us to marry preoperative views inside the the brain. Yeah to then directing the technology to be able to affect change within the brain. Sure. Are we seeing innovation come out, I think, since the 70s with, you know, CAT scan technology sort of pick up the pace as it, I'm assuming when you mentioned it was in its infancy for a long time, you sort of see that infancy ending in around the 70s when CAT scans allowed you to look in but not violate the box of the skull. So is innovation ramping up since then? And what are some of those innovations that you think have changed the field of neurosurgery? Oh, yeah, I think this is, there, there probably has never been a more exciting time to be a neurosurgeon. Yeah. Um, we have technologies that allow us to, I think there are three different areas of technological innovation that have really helped with neurosurgery. Um, the first is just simply magnification and seeing, mm -hmm. viewing. So microscopes and micro instruments have allowed us to operate much smaller with much more delicacy than mm -hmm. we were able to operate before. Sure. And that's just purely because we can mag magnify things and we can see them better. Yeah. We can also think about the functional consequences of what we do, mm -hmm. and we can monitor what the brain is doing or what parts of the brain are doing at the time of operation. So that neurophysiologic monitoring and the ability to actually, instead of just seeing the organ, mm -hmm. actually assess function while we're operating to stay away from important function has really changed our ability to intervene. Do you mind if I ask you about that a little bit? Sure. Okay, so, and I, I'm assuming, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when you're operating on someone's brain, it's very delicate, obviously, because you don't want to permanently impair their speech. So what sort of things, or their ability to move, you know, those kind of things. So what, how, what kind of precautions do you take to make sure you're not in, impacting their speech center of their brain, or their movement center, or any other center? So it's very interesting, you know, if you talk to, neurosurgeons a generation or two ago, mm -hmm. um, there was sort of this idea that we don't like to operate on the left side of the brain because the left side of the brain is where speech was mm -hmm. or speech is. Sure. And um, the left side was sort of a no-fly zone <laughs> yeah. because it was, uh, it was unpredictable where in the left frontal lobe speech was. Mm -hmm. But as we've gotten better and better and better at localizing, we've been able to intervene much more, leaving speech intact. Mm -hmm. So the first way that that was done was in the 60s, mid 60s to early 70s, mm -hmm. people started to do procedures while patients were awake and speaking, yeah. right? Yeah. And everybody's heard of you know being operated on, your, on yeah. while you're awake. Yeah. So awake craniotomies were a great way of, of monitoring speech. But as imaging technology got better and better, we were able to actually functionally image the brain and light up areas that were important in speech preoperatively so we didn't have to do as much awake craniotomy. So is the patient awake and you have electrodes attached to their scalp, just sensing those areas? Or how does that go? How does that, how does that actually, happen? Actually, to get a functional image of the brain, it's just an MRI scan. And really? so you go into the, the, the patient goes into the MRI scan. Uh -huh and they're asked to do a certain series of tasks. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a very interesting technique where you do a task, and it can be a motor task, it sure. can be a thinking task, it can be a visualization task, whatever that task may be. Right. So for speech, it would be trying to generate some language. Mm -hmm. 
and they do a scan for a certain amount of time and then you clear your mind and you don't do that task for a certain amount of time. They can subtract the blood flow images between the two and it shows where the blood flow is increased for that particular task. And that, that's very interesting to me. That is the area that is activated during that thought task. So based on blood flow alone? Based on can... the change in blood flow to yeah. a certain area of brain. And it turns out that that's highly correlated to the area of neuronal activation, mm -hmm. which is how we map that area on an image, and then we can use that map to stay away from it. Awesome, so then you don't have to do as many awake. Correct. Neurosurgeries. Correct. Yeah. We can also map motor areas, for example, that way. And then we can combine that with intraoperative mapping where we actually stimulate the motor area, mm -hmm. verify that that's where the motor area is, and stay away from it. And sure. so those are called motor mapping cases. We yeah. do quite a few of those as well here. So you also mentioned that Lehigh Valley uh, Health Network is a comprehensive stroke center. And I'd imagine that has its own, you know, requirements to get that designation. So what are some of those requirements? So a comprehensive stroke center is um, the kind of the highest designation of stroke center. Okay. Um, the designation comes with the ability, again, like trauma, to provide the spectrum of care to stroke patients. Mm -hmm. And that includes uh, the rapid diagnosis of stroke and the rapid intervention for stroke, including some of the newer things like um, intra-arterial TPA, mm -hmm. which is a clot busting technique. So stop the stroke before it happens. S try to dissolve the clot before right. it has a chance to completely uh, destroy the brain that, that is cut off from blood, okay. the blood supply. Um, also do interventional, um, interventional procedures in order to stop aneurysms from bleeding mm -hmm. or to glue vascular malformations, and then also to treat the sicker stroke patients and try to get them through that episode mm -hmm. so that we can salvage as much brain as we can. Yeah. Well, because much like trauma, strokes can cause a part of the brain to just sort of be there one day and not the next, right? Correct. So you want to make sure that you can salvage as much of it as possible so their quality of life is as high right. as possible. Minimize any further damage, salvage yeah. as much as we can. And in this day and age, I think the exciting part of stroke work is that we can reverse some of these strokes if we can bust the clot or mm -hmm. we can open up the blood vessel with an inter interventional technique. Mm -hmm. um, you've heard of cardiac stenting, for yeah. example. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't stent arteries in the brain, but if a brain artery becomes clogged, the interventionalist can drive a catheter into that clogged artery uh -huh. and suction out the clot or put a clot busting drug into that clot, dissolve it and restore blood flow. And uh, that has proven to be a miraculous way to treat strokes. And we can take people yeah. who would have gone on to have severe disabilities, mm -hmm. reverse the blood flow issue, and they can be relatively normal. That's awesome, that's truly amazing. So like, you're able to go remove the clot, extract it, or just dissolve it. And as the blood flow returns to the, the brain, they regain maybe not all function that they, they lost, but they get some of it back. In fact, so it can be partial, but we've had mm -hmm. several patients who've had full restoration of function and go back to being themselves. Yeah, I'd imagine, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of that has to do with the time that that section of the brain was sort of at a loss of blood flow. Correct, and that's part of the designation as Comprehensive Stroke Center. Mm -hmm we have to demonstrate that we can intervene within a very short amount of time mm -hmm. because time is of the essence when it comes to these kinds of issues. So I'd imagine to get both the level one trauma center and you know those sort of designations, you have to sort of ha be on the front lines of what's new and like what's cutting edge. So what are some of the cutting edge things that are coming down sort of the neurosurgery uh, sector? Um, I, I think the, the ones that pop into my mind are, I think, functional neurosurgery mm -hmm. is an area that is extremely exciting, um, is probably still in its infancy, but will become a very important area of neurosurgery that gains much more traction in the, in the next generation. Functional neurosurgery is surgery in order to alter or restore function. Okay. And the surgery that you've probably heard of is surgery for Parkinson's disease mm -hmm. in the tremor. So in those surgeries, we're not cutting anything out. Right. 
we're actually putting an electrode deep within the brain. Yeah, deep brain stimulation. To stimulate, mm -hmm. and that stimulation actually restores function. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that there are also procedures that are on the horizon that modify function. So there are techniques to stimulate parts of the brain that may end up influencing mood, for mm -hmm. example. So there are some trials out now that are looking at stimulation for severe depression or OCD. There are hmm. stimulation concepts to help with seizures as well. And these are all in their infancy, but I think functional neurosurgery is a very exciting area. So that deep brain stimulation can impact things like mood and uh, I guess, uh, like you mentioned OCD. So that's, I didn't, I, I mean, I realized that that was housed in the brain, but I didn't realize we were at the place where we could focus in on it like that. So there, is a, there have been some small trials mm -hmm. on using stimulation to counteract OCD symptoms. And they've actually been quite successful. That's awesome. So let's talk a little bit about endoscopic surgery sure. and minimalist keyhole surgery. Yeah. I think the, the one the one big area that, uh, that has really taken off in the past 10 years is minimal access surgery mm -hmm. and uh, minimally invasive surgery. And yeah. this includes using rigid telescopes or endoscopes in mm -hmm. order to operate. So we can operate now through very, very small openings and affect the same sort of results that we were able to do before only with big openings. And that has improved quality of life for patients. It's shortened the recovery time for patients. Mm -hmm. And that's really been a big leap forward for us. Excellent. So let me close with one final question. And that simply would be, uh, if you were talking to someone who is considering residencies, their specialization, if you will, um, what would be your sales pitch to get them to take on neurosurgery? My first sales pitch would be to say that you got to do what you love. Sure. And uh, I tell all of the younger residents this, that if you're not truly in love with that specialty. Yeah, whatever it is. Whatever it is. Yeah. Be careful. Yeah. I think neurosurgery is the greatest specialty around, <laughs> of course. Um, it requires a level of precision mm -hmm. and a level of care that I think is much higher than many other surgical specialties, mostly because we operate on an organ that doesn't recover well. So other surgeries operate in ways where their organs can heal. Mm -hmm. The brain doesn't heal very well. Right. So if you like being on the edge, if you like doing something that is highly technical, highly specialized, and has no room for error, this is the field for you. <laughs> it is very high stakes, it seems. It's high stakes, and most of us love it. Most yeah. of us love that aspect of it. Yeah. We thrive on it, and if you are that person, please consider us. Well, and clearly a lot of those people exist because you are one yourself, but you also have quite a few that work underneath you here at uh, yes, the Health Center. So thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for doing this uh, episode with us. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks. Thanks.